تو را سرین که با ما فرو می آید مرا دلی که صبوری از او نمی آید کدام دیده بر روی تو باز شد همه It also, as this graph shows, not only has large oil reserves, 
It also has enormous reserves of natural gas. This graph that you've seen before, you can see the size of Iranian reserves probably equal to those of Iraq, larger than those of Kuwait, not as large as Saudi Arabia, but that can be said of every other country in the world. Its natural gas revenues are second only to Russia's. Iran is estimated to have 15% of all the natural gas on the planet. And last but not least, the Strait of Hormuz, of course, uh, is a critical way in which oil moves in and out. So, of course, as we will see, oil will be central to this whole story. Now, one thing we noted both in talking about Afghanistan and Iraq was extensive ethnic conflict. And one of the very interesting things about Iran is not that ethnic conflict has not happened and does not happen, it does. But that relative to those countries, it has been much more muted. There has been much less of it. And that is not because the country is ethnically homogeneous. It isn't. This is basically a kind of idea of ethnic groups, as usual, defined largely by language. Persian, which is an Indo-European language, just like ours. Osiri, which is a dialect of Turkish, is another uh, group. And although there has been conflict, particularly between other people in the state and the Kurds, there hasn't been conflict on anything like the same scale as conflict in Afghanistan or Iraq or in Lebanon or in Yemen. And it's interesting to see one hypothesis as to why this is so is that the country tends to be united by religion. It's united by Shia. The large majority of the population of Iran are Shia Muslim. This, as usual, is, is, has been historically produced. And that, then, is a, is a useful place to start in talking about some of the special features of Iran. There are lots of others that we'll get to. The kind of Shiism in Iran is called Twelver Shiism, named after the number of Imams who think were there, uh, inheritors of Ali, before the twelfth one disappeared. It's a religion that has a very strong stress on justice. Very strong. <laughs> It also is a messianic kind of religion. They have the notion of the idea being that there was sacrifice by a man named Ali and then by his son Hussein, who was murdered, who is a martyr. We should emulate this, this martyr, and we should be, feel badly about ourselves because we have not been able to do as well, and this is what we try to do. And this messianism also includes a kind of end times uh, theology, which interestingly includes the notion that not only will the Mahdi or the Savior, the last Imam, come to earth, but his leading companion will be Jesus of Nazareth. And they will then establish the reign of justice on earth. It's also a religion which has a clerical hierarchy. This is quite different from Sunni Islam, where essentially there is no hierarchy. But at this hierarchy, which again was historically produced, particularly in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, is very important. There is a notion of ijtihad, which is just Arabic for interpretation. There is wide latitude for the Shia clergy to interpret and innovate within the religion, uh, rather more so than is typical in, by some interpretations in Sunni Islam. In Iran, last but hardly least, the clergy, unlike the Sunni clergy in most parts of, of the Sunni world, has long been independent of the state. They had this independence economically, which allowed them, given their ideology, to stand as the representatives of justice of the people against an oppressive state. So that's the basic notion. There's this myth of Ali and his son Hussein, martyrs for justice. This is varied throughout history, interpreted in different, in different ways. If you look at the slide from last lecture, you'll see this poster right here of Hussein being held up by a Shi'i demonstrator in Baghdad demonstrating against the Americans. So you get this sort of thing. We also know that there was a Safavid Empire, which is when the country of Iran became Shi'i Muslim. It is not true that this country has always been Shi'i Muslim. It, 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 that's not true. Historically, the conversion of a large majority of Iranians took place in starting in 1500 and thereafter. By the 19th century, there was a different dynasty called the Qajars, and these folks had to fight against the Russians and against uh, folks in Central Asia and then the British. 
and we'll talk about some of that later on. The great transformation in Iran, understanding and thinking about this, is absolutely central to making any sense out of what has happened and what is likely to happen in the future. These twin transformations, both of the economy of the socioeconomic sphere and of the state and of the state's relationship with society, have dominated 20th century Iranian history, as we'll talk about later. This transformation is quite far advanced in many ways, as we'll see in a second. This process of state formation, in all its aspects, has been equally dramatic. The process of state formation, showing that Janus face that all states have, they're both looking inside the society, but also outside, has been critical. And oil, of course, has been a critical component once it was discovered at each level. If you really want to know a lot about this, do yourself a favor and read er Erevan Abrahamian's book sometime, like during the summer, you'll learn a lot. Here's some examples about this transformation. Consider what Iran looked like about a century ago. The population was about 12 million. 80% of the population did not live in cities, only 20% lived in cities. Nomads, 25%, a third, a quarter to a third, maybe that some think that's an underestimate, large chunk of the population was nomadic. Life expectancy at birth was 30. One out of two children that were born died before their first birthday. Only 5% of the population was literate. 2,000 people out of that 12 million were in schools and there were no universities at all. What does Iran look like now? The population is at least 70 million. That's roughly more than two times as large as the roughly 27 to 28 million people each in Afghanistan and Iraq. Two thirds of the population is urban, as I mentioned. Nomads are now a tiny 3% of the population, insignificant. Life expectancy at birth is now 70 years. Infant mortality rate is now 30 per thousand. Literate, 84% of the population is literate. 19 million kids are in school, and there are over one and a half million students in Iranian universities. This is pretty significant, and you know we're from a previous lecture, the case study about the Iranian demographic revolution and demographic transition that was one of the most rapid in the world. Something similar can be seen if we contrast the Iranian state of 100 years ago with the Iranian state today. There were four, count them, four government ministers. Government spending was a little over $8 million. There were no civil servants whatsoever. That was it. The armed forces, a whopping 7,000 men under arms. What does it look like now, more or less? There are 28 different government ministries. Government spending is around $40 billion. There are well over three quarters of a million civil servants, and it has an armed forces of over half a million men. This is a remarkable transformation in the space of a century. A simple graphic shows the kind of basic way that the form of the state changed during the 20th century, starting off with a classical, typical system of household rule then transforming into a kind of royal autocracy, and then in turn transforming into a modern bureaucratic state in good Moss Weber fashion. And of course, we have the usual suspects with oil. It provided significant revenues for social transformation. It helped to centralize the state. It also provided a source of friction and conflict with outside powers, and of course, it still does. So let's go back to the 19th century and talk about the transformation of this country. It's transformation from being a small, isolated, backward, poor country to being the country that clearly has the, is the biggest, the most transformed socially, economically, and in many ways in terms of the state in the Persian Gulf which, I remind you, has at least two-thirds of all the oil reserves in the world. What did Qajar Iran look like? Well, it was pretty typical. It had a very weak central state. It was a monarchical state. There were organized, heavily armed tribes. These tribes, these nomads, were organized. They were tribal. It was, you know, your brother is your shield kind of world. 
The royal family used the Islamic, the fact that in Islam you can marry and divorce to do sort of what King Saul did, marry women from various social groups, have children with them, then divorce them, marry someone else as a way to forge alliances. There were a set of notables, a kind of landed aristocracy that had been created. And as I mentioned, the clergy, the Shi'i clergy, had income, typically from land, but also from trade, independent of the state. The society was fragmented by geography and by technology into small, self-contained tribes, villages, and towns. The strongest tribal confederations were a group called the Bakhtiaris, an Indo-European speaking group. Here's an example of the chieftain of the Bakhtiaris in the 19th century. These guys were formidable powers, as we will see later, and you know what's going to happen. The power of guys like this will be smashed, because that's the nature of the creation of a modern state. State making is organized crime, and it means one thug gets rid of all the others. That's the way it works. What the Qajars did was, again, very typical. They pursued a policy of divide and rule. They often had fewer soldiers than the tribes. They could call on fewer people. They had no inscription. They had no army. They had to beg and weed and wheedle and cajole people to come and fight for them, while the tribal confederations were much better organized. So how did they manage? Well, the usual way. They relied on local power wheels. They had a very strong emphasis on religious legitimacy. This is a thread that runs through modern Iranian history. And above all, they exploited social divisions, classic divide and rule kind of strategy. Meanwhile, of course, states don't just look inside, they have to look outside. And, of course, the Qajars had their clocks cleaned repeatedly by starting in the late uh, 18th century and then repeatedly after that by the Russians who invaded northern Iran in 1813 and 1828. Indeed, there were wars in the Caucasus that later became part of the Soviet Union, which had been under Iranian influence, a long series of wars, all of which the Russians won, and then imposed treaties upon Iran. The British show up in 1857 in the aftermath of uh, the War of Independence that failed in India. And Iran then becomes a buffer zone. Again, something you've seen in a, in a way similar to Afghanistan, only more directly. It's a bigger country. It has a, a, a greater strategic location because it's on the Gulf and closer to Russia itself. So the British and the Russians have always been key players in domestic politics in this country until recently. This also helped foster a kind of paranoid political style. Uh, so Iranians said the reason Iranians are paranoid and think everyone's out to get us is that actually everyone is out to get us. That's what our history tends to show. So this, is, but this also becomes a problem, the notion that the foreigners uh, are the ones who did it. What were the social consequences of all this? Well, as the Western powers, as the Russians and the British begin to encroach, say the British in particular, begin to demand access to the market for their own merchants, and formerly isolated merchants and the ulama, or the clergy, become aware of common grievances against the foreigners and also against the Iranian state, which is allowing these foreigners to come in and bring their goods in and wipe out the local merchants and so on. They do not wipe them out, but at least compete with them. This is the origin of a critical social alliance in Iranian history, modern Iranian history, which is the alliance between the bazaar, which is a kind of shorthand way of saying traditional merchants located in the traditional sections of, of, the old, of the old cities, a kind of merchant training class, and the clergy. This will be critical in explaining both the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and the ongoing alliance that is under, undergirds the power of the current state in the Islamic Republic of Iran. There's also, of course, if a state tries to modernize, what's it going to do? You know already what it's going to do is it's going to start trying to create the cadre for a bureaucracy and an army. That means you have to educate people. As you start to educate them, they get, begin to pick up modern, quote unquote, political and social ideas. Meanwhile, the Europeans are very powerful, so they can extract things called concessions saying basically privileges that, to them that are go beyond the kind of privileges extended to locals. The Qajars had, did this for the usual reason. 
They were unable to raise adequate tax revenue, so they started selling off monopoly rights to foreigners. This began in 1874 with mines and railways and roads and tramways and industries of all kinds. Then there was a concession on tobacco that was given to a set of outsiders. These had to be canceled because of riots and protests throughout the country, the, and the clergy called for a boycott of tobacco in Iran, as in so much of the Middle East, already by then, essentially everyone smoked tobacco, and basically a country of nicotine addicts quit smoking, they just put down the pack, would have had nice health consequences had it lasted, but it didn't because the Shah had to get, the, the, the king had to give in, and the tobacco concession was canceled. So notice this. Iran is very different in its history from other parts of, of this part of the world because you'll have a phenomenon of the ability of the clergy to mobilize large numbers of people for political action. This goes back over 100 years, and you can see this in the, in, in the riots against the tobacco concession uh, that led to its cancel. And the last concession of interest to us, of course, is the cancel, is the oil concession to William Darcy, the first time that the origins of the initial oil production in the region. Then after, in the next decade, there is a kind of a revolution, and essentially what's going to happen is that a 10-year period of social disintegration will set in. The government was bankrupt. So it tried to run the printing paragraph, so of course you get rampant inflation. The government begins to attack merchants because they're sending out people to riot and protest against them. Then the mullahs, the clergy and merchants, they uh, use a kind of tradition of seeking sanctuary. This even included one of the British consular legations. And using this to constantly demand, they were demanding a constitution and a parliament called a majlis in Farsi, also an Arabic word. And the Shah was forced to grant this. So, way back to 100 years ago, there was a notion of a demand for some kind of constitutional government with a parliament, and the king, had, the Shah, had to agree with it. They enacted a series of quite liberal laws, but these liberal laws had no social basis under during that. They also included a role for a council of clergy to vet legislation. This was not exercised until the Islamic Revolution of 1979, when today it is one of the pillars of the entire, of the entire political order in Iran. But again, notice, this is not brand new. This is something that went back a long time in Iranian history. Yeah? Uh, to what extent did the Constitutional Revolution, was it... What extent was it a reaction to these That was part of it. Was a and the notion, it's the usual story, it's the notion that some of the, the king, the, the Shah is trying to give concessions to raise money. He gives these concessions. Then you have foreigners. This is offensive. This is an offense both to vested interests and to vested ideas. It's an offense to people's economic interests. It's also ideologically offensive because they're foreigners. How come they get special privileges? Uh, they're not even Muslims. What's this about? How come? And then the Shah says, well, I'm doing this anyway. So then it becomes a demonstration not just against foreigners, but also against the Shah. So it's, a, it's the usual kind of mixture. Well, there's a backlash on the part of the state. The Shah, trying to create a modern military force, had asked the czarist Russians to come in and set up a Cossack regiment, basically a cavalry regiment. And this had happened. And he used those troops for a military coup in 1908. There is a deal between the British and the Russians splitting Iran into zones of influence. The Majlis, the parliament, made enemies by trying to increase taxation. <laughs> they made further enemies by trying to promote secular reforms. The beginnings of the modern military lie in this Cossack regiment. We will see that the first Pahlavi Shah comes directly out of this particular group. So what happened at this point was a civil war. On the parliamentary side, you had nationalist and socialist volunteers. Remember, this is on the run-up to World War I. You have large-scale socialist agi agitation throughout the Russian Empire. So there are Armenians, Georgians, Russians from the Caucasus, all who are various left-wing strikes who are fighting on the side of the parliamentarians. 
And then, because politics always makes strange bedfellows, you have a feudal lord from Mazandaran, on one of our uh, region in the west of Iran, and Bakhtiari tribesmen, a very motley array of folks fighting for the parliament. They won, but it was a hollow victory. Because you take over the state, but there's really nothing to take over, because there is no state. There is no centralized state machinery. This leads to fragmentation and increasing power of local power wielders. Then, World War I erupts. The Russians go into Azerbaijan, then into Tehran, that's actually before World War I. British troops go into southern Iran, and this intensifies with World War I. The Ottomans, the Ottoman Turks, invaded Azerbaijan in the northwest. They take Tabriz, the big city. There, British counterattacks from Iraq, as we talked about before, and the Gulf. This map shows the zones of influence with the Russians in this part, the British down here, and here are the British in these other locations. And all of this leads to chaos. And so what you've got was the rise of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. First, you have war, disruptions all over the place, a series of bad harvests and famines, epidemics, both the cholera epidemic and then the 1919 global influenza pandemic, which killed millions of people all over the world, including in Iran. And the deaths accounted 2 million Iranians. Remember, we're talking a population now about 12 million people. <coughs> 25% of the rural population perished in this combined. So it was quite a mess. Into this mess, after World War I is over, very most helpfully, and not really, will step the British. And the overreaching imperialist, this man, Lord Curzon, was the vice, the viceroy of India. That is, he was the British ruler in India. He drafted an agreement called the anglo persian Agreement between the two states. And his idea was basically simple. He wanted to incorporate Persia, as it was called then, into the British Indian Empire. The goal was essentially turn Iran into something like a mandate, just as Iraq had been turned into a mandate. As one observer, a British uh, observer, said, his imperialism was founded on the belief that God had per personally selected the British upper class as an instrument of the divine will. As I hope you have learned by now, when people begin to talk about themselves as instruments of divine will and politics, find the nearest exit and run. <laughs> Do not walk to the nearest exit. So Iran in 1921 was essentially a failed state. There were revolts in the north. There was a essentially allies of the Bolsheviks set up a Soviet Socialist Republic. There were riots, assassinations, collapse of the government. Provinces had fallen to the hands of rebels of one sort or another, or perhaps tribal leaders. Bandits were roving all over the place. And this, of course, is the background for fought because, as we have known ever since Aristotle, the only thing worse than tyranny is anarchy. And so what you got was a coup. What you, you begin is the beginnings of the Pahlavi dynasty, which is a quote, the dynasty is in quotes because it's only two, two people. And this is the founder. His name was Reza Shah. He was a tough guy, and his goals were strikingly modern. He wanted to build a modern, strong state with a monopoly on violence that could face the great powers as an equal. This, notice, is a long-term goal of anybody in charge of the Iranian state. It was a goal of Reza Shah. It was a goal of his son, and it is a goal today of the Islamic Republic. His authoritarianism is a good example of conjuncture in history. He himself came from a military background. That military background, additionally, was permeated with the culture of the czarist military, which, to put it mildly, was highly authoritarian. Furthermore, this is the age of dictators in the interwar period, when liberalism doesn't look so good anyway. And there are lots of dictators. And last, but by hardly least, he had the example next door in Turkey of Atatürk as a modernizing autocrat. So again, conjuncture is everywhere. Riza Shah sets about trying to build a modern state. And he there we can round up the usual suspects, the military and the bureaucracy. The military rose from 22,000 to over well over 100,000 men. The central government starts from essentially nobody working for it to 90,000 people working for it. And he does this because he can get his hands on money. He gets oil money. 
He confiscates people's property. He puts customs duties because now he is regaining control of customs. And he puts taxes on consumer goods. His strategy is essentially this. He uses court patronage to build up a bureaucracy and build up a military and use both the military and the bureaucracy to increase the power of the state and extend its control over this very geographically large and diverse uh, population. The bottom line for any state, always and everywhere, is a monopoly on violence. He built up a professional army in which he took a direct personal interest. That makes sense. He was himself, after all, a career soldier. He faced various regional revolts, which he crushed, and he was not pretty about how he did it. He crushed them into all these different regions. He introduced conscription in 1925. Again, very common sort of notion. The idea goes back to Napoleon. You do this to create a modern, bureaucratized military independent of local power sources as a way to establish this monopoly on violence. And he established a rural police force and an urban police force. All these ways in which we see over and over again are part of the way that you try to create a modern state. Now, of course, to do this, he had to take on the biggest power other than himself, and that were the tribes. And he did this in the usual way. And he was able to do this because, remember, by now we're into the 20th century. We have not only repeating rifles, we have machine guns. And so he was able to do this. He forcibly centralized many tribes people. He arrested and murdered their leaders. He promoted internal feuds, dividing and rule, and tribal power never recovered. He broke it permanently uh, in this country. Again, if you substitute tribes instead of putting in tribes which grow out of the aridity of the Iranian plateau and instead in the much better watered European context, substitute feudal lords dotting around, you can see this would be an exact rerun of much of early modern European history in which the state systematically sets out to destroy other kinds of regional power leaders. And he creates a bureaucracy. He is, uses the interior ministry to extend the state's control out into provinces and towns. Big expansion in personnel, as we've seen. Lots of use of patronage, and he can do this. You know, oil rents aren't huge, but they're there. They're present. So from the beginning, he has a kind of sort resource that he can use in this state-making policy. And corruption. He makes himself one of the richest men in the region, especially by acquiring land. He transforms the parliament, which exists, into a kind of rubber stamp institution. He makes it into something that's not of any particular interest. So you get Parliament in 1937. There's basically a debating society. And he sets up a set of economic policies, economic statism. Again, you would expect this, right? This is, after all, the period of import substituting industrialization. We're talking the 20s and 30s here. And so everyone all over the world is doing this, and so he does it too. He gets rid of all concessions except the oil concession. That he doesn't try to take on but he gets rid of all the others. He puts up tariffs. He creates a system of import and export licenses to try to keep out foreign goods. He sets up 300 different state-owned industries doing just what everybody else does. He has low interest loans that he tries to funnel to his friends and cronies to try to encourage them to set up local factories. And he builds roads, lots of roads. And he builds railroads, quite a few railroads. Again, all very typical kind of description of the way states try to foster the transformation of society by trying to accelerate the great transformation. And we get social changes accompanying this. Conscription everywhere in the world transforms peasants and tribesmen into Iranians. Uh, there's a famous book called Peasants into Frenchmen, which is about 19th century France, in which one of the forces is, uh, is uh, conscription uh, as a way to try to get people to give up their local loyalties and then become, have, develop a kind of nationalist consciousness. He imposed family names, which people had not had before. He changed the calendar. He imposed a dress code, just like Ataturk. He banned the veil. He made men wear hats very similar to what Ataturk did. 
He expanded education always in Farsi, the Indo-European language, sometimes translated as Persian, not, for example, in expanding it in the Turkic language, Azeri and Azerbaijan, but instead, again, creating a kind of national language that everybody would speak so everybody could talk to everybody else. In 1934, he changed the name of the country, which before this had been known as Persia, and he began calling it Iran, although Iran had been used among many Iranians before as a geographical expression. He changed this name. It is part of state building that you don't just do create a monopoly on violence, and you don't just do this by getting revenue and creating a bureaucracy and extending your control all over the country, although, of course, you do all of those things. But you also have to innovate ideologically. You have to create a new set of ideas that people will believe in and adhere to, and this involves inventing traditions. Remember this. People talk about traditions. If you dig under the surface of most traditions, you will find that they were made up. People invented them. Everything is a product. Everything comes from causes and conditions never, ever fall into the trap of essentialist thinking. He promoted a kind of Iranian nationalism. This had, especially in the 1930s, a kind of racist undertone. Iran, after all, is the Orway is very closely linked to the word Aryan, a word that was used, of course, by the Nazis. The flag and language and place name changes. He was trying to get rid of Arabic and Turkic words. It's very interesting. At the same time, Ataturk in, in the Turkish language was trying to get rid of Arabic and Persian words. Everybody wants to get rid of their neighbor's words. You know, his language reforms, trying to invent traditions. He set up a whole series of museums and libraries and mausoleums glorifying the ancient pre-Islamic Persian past, built all kinds of squares and boulevards doing all this kind of thing. His flag shows this ideology. Sort of the idea, notice there is nothing, there are no Islamic symbols on this flag. It's an ancient Persian lion holding a sword, the crown of the king, a rising sun. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was the plan. But, of course, this whole project and this ideology faced opposition. It always does. Many clerics were unimpressed. The bazaaris were equally unimpressed. After all, they stayed on factories, might compete with them. And possibly they might get their hands on some of the loans, but many of them did not because they were sort of viewed as backward. And some educated, Europeanized, middle-class people, especially some nationalists, were suspicious of Reza Shah. They thought he depended on the British for seizing power way back in 1921. This is perhaps overdrawn, but the British did help. They also didn't like the agreement he signed with what's now British Petroleum in 1933-34, where the government got a 4% royalty increase, which is probably why Reza Shah signed it and wanted to need the revenue. But remember, this is still quite low. We're still talking 20%. This was when it changed from 16% of total rents to 20% of total rents uh, and extended this lease for 50 years, which is a very long time. So this was offensive to Iranian nationalists. Because Reza Shah was an opponent of both the Russians and the British, you can see that as World War II approaches, approaches, he will not necessarily be friendly to the Allied cause in World War II. He was suspected of being friendly to the Germans. And when World War II came in, the Allies desperately needed a land bridge to resupply the Soviets. There was the question of oil. So Reza Shah was deposed in 1941, shortly after the same uh, deposition of Rashid Ali uh, in Baghdad, were kicked out by the British uh, because of the wartime exigencies. And instead, they placed his son, Mohammad Reza Shah, on the throne, who at the time was only 22 years old. World War II supply routes through Iran were important. <coughs> Because, after all, once uh, given, especially the Soviet, given the, the, the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, there was no way other than going up through the Arctic to try to get supplies to the Russians, which the Allies then did through Iran and the Caspian to funnel them into the hands of the Red Army. So they took them over. But, of course, Iranians are unimpressed. 
The Shah controlled the military, but not the bureaucracy and the patronage system, because that tended still to be in a, in being controlled by the, the sort of joint condominium of the British and the Russians. And so you get this very complicated contest for power amongst all these different groups. The Shah, the cabinet, the Majlis, all these people sort of jockeying for different positions of power. It's sometimes been described as a kind of feudal democracy uh, by some historians of modern Iran. One element of the opposition was the Workers' Party, called the Tudeh Party in Farsi, which had strong support among urban wage earners and salaried middle class people who were attracted ideologically. These people were the first to demand the nationalization of the Iranian oil industry. They were the first to introduce mass politics into Iran. Mm, this is one argument. Some would say it goes back further with the clergy, but there is a way in which this kind of use of modern organi organizational tour tools was first pioneered by them. They were undermined in a variety of ways. First, the Soviets, at, at the end of World War II, were reluctant to withdraw from northern Iran. Indeed, some people think that one of the origins of the Cold War lies in Stalin's reticence in pulling out of Iran, although many other causes, of course. But the Soviets demanded oil concessions, and they also sponsored autonomy movements, none of which was very pleasing to Iranian nationalists. Finally, in 1949, there was an attempted assassination uh, of the Shah. It failed. Uh, the two dead party were accused of complicity, and so the party was outlawed. But the decline of the two or its weakening, of course, created opening for other people. And this is typical. You can get rid of one opposition group, but as we saw in looking at the history of the Cold War and the Arab world, if you get rid of the Marxists, you're going to get somebody else. It's not like everyone then says, oh, fine, it's just great uh, for the Americans or the British or the French or whoever it is that's come in here and tell us what to do. So you, this creates an opening, first, for sort of middle-class liberal nationalists like Mohammed Mossadegh that we've talked a little bit about. He's a man who was a, sort of an icon of Iranian nationalism. He came from an elite background. He had indeed had Qajar ancestry, the pre previous dynasty. He had been educated in France and Switzerland, spoke French and English and Far Farsi. He was the leader of a group called the National Front. He was elected prime minister in 1951. He was hugely popular. And as you know, he nationalized the Iranian oil industry. And as you also know, he was then overthrown by a coup organized by the United States Central Intelligence Agency in 1953. Just for a review from previous lectures, you know that there was an intense struggle over cash and control in Iran between the Iranian state and the oil companies. The grievances were 80-20. The Iranians were only getting 20%. And you recall, at the same time, the Saudis and other folks in the region were getting 50%. Iranians couldn't understand why this was true. They couldn't see the accounts, all these sorts of things that were affronts to sovereignty. The Iranians demanded 50-50, but British Petroleum would not back down for various reasons as we talked about, and then you get nationalization in 1951. This was hugely popular, but the timing was dreadful because very quickly thereafter, Eisenhower and the Republican Party took over the U.S. executive branch, and these were people whose politics, to put it mildly, found nationalization anathema and were fervent, indeed, paranoid cold warriors. And you remember what happened next. Everybody else, all the other companies, boycotted Iranian oil. British Petroleum could increase its output in Iraq, and the other majors increased output in Iraq and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And so we had interest. We were afraid of Cold War. We had these gentlemen who had their, put their privileged backgrounds and business orientation, could not understand why anyone would want to nationalize anything. And so, of course, Iranian oil revenues collapsed. And this then led to social unrest, which we helped to foment, but it was more complex than that. There were lots of domestic origins to it. And then we get Operation Ajax, which was the code name for the U.S. coup. Actually, there were two coups. The first one failed. 
But then there was a second attempt. This meant Kermit Roosevelt, Jr., CIA guy, enthusiastic backing. We were obsessed with communism, and this led, as you know, to the restoration of Western oil companies in Iran. How did this coup work? Well, we demanded that Mossadegh compensate BP. He refused. This led into conflict with the Shah. Mossadegh was on one side, and the Shah was on the other. Shah perceived as the pro-Western guy. Mossadegh then relied increasingly on two-dead party and other groups, and especially the two-dead party, which were viewed as Marxist. This was in a Cold War atmosphere, viewed as inimical to American interests. We sponsored a coup. Also drawing on some traditional, quote unquote, Bazari support, who were a little alarmed by nationalization. Remember, Islamists tend to not be all that crazy about, about nationalization, although, as we'll see, this all depends on the context. And the Shah was reinstated. Mossadegh was sent to prison for three years and then placed under house arrest until he died in 1967. And the Shah was strongly backed by the United States from then on. Now, one of the recurring themes that we've seen over and over in here is that history always has a very long and very nasty arm. The muse of, the muse of history, of Greek mythology, Clio, has a wicked, even evil sense of humor. So what do we get? We get the image in Iran of the Shah as a toady to the foreigners. Not good for your legitimacy. We get the notion that the Iranian military is really there as a prop for the foreign imperialists. And the Iranians begin, for the first time, to see the United States, rather than the British, as the principal enemy of, of Iranian nationalism and sovereignty. It also destroyed the nationalists under Mossadegh and the two-dead party. And again, when you destroy one kind of opposition, you strengthen other kinds of oppositional ideologies, very much including Islamism. And here are some posters with the Farsi slogan, Mar Bar Amrika, Farsi for death to America, which became a slogan of Islamists. So, now we need to talk about this man, Muhammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, the rise and fall of a rentier monarch because oil rents will be huge in what he does, but also, as we'll see, what he's really doing is simply continuing what his father was doing, trying to create a modern state, trying to create a modern society, trying to establish a kind of ideology that will underpin all of this, but this will all go very, very wrong. His recipe for rule was really pretty simple. Big Dad's project of creating a centralized state, military, bureaucracy, court patronage, and huge amounts of oil rent, you know, push the stir violent. <laughs> there it is. That's the Shah Pahlavi's recipe for rule. And he did have a lot of rents to pour into the cauldron. This graph shows what happened to oil revenues under the Shah. Of course, they explode uh, in this early 1970s. Period. So what does he do with all this money? He does the usual things that we would expect. First of all, he tries to support the military. Military budget increased 12-fold from 1954 to 1977. The number of men under arms rose from 120,000 to over 400,000. By 1975, he had the largest navy in the Persian Gulf. He had the largest air force in all of Western Asia, anywhere from Turkey uh, all the way through. He had the fifth largest army in the world. Okay? In the world. We're including here the Red Army of the Soviet Union, the People's Liberation Army of China, the Armed Forces of the United States of America. That's a lot of that. That's pretty heavy. That, that's the big wigs, right? So he did this. He placed orders of 12 billion in 1978 alone. He bought more Centurion tanks, the kind of tank made in the United Kingdom, than were in the possession of the entire British Army. He had this whole idea of Iran as the local power. He envisioned Iran as a Middle Eastern Prussia, 
So again, notice this idea of Iran being able to become the most powerful country in the region does not start with the Islamic Revolution. This has long historical roots in Iran, and it's not at all surprising. He also relied on repression. Sabak was the acronym for the Internal Intelligence Services. It was established in 1957. He had some expert advice from the FBI, the CIA, and the Israeli Mossad. There were some 5,000 uh, uh, openly acknowledged operatives and an unknown but very large number of informers. The director met privately with the Shah every morning, and torture and disappearances were widespread in the mid-1970s. Amnesty International described Iran as one of the worst human rights abusers in the world. And remember, this guy is a close ally of the United States. Bureaucracy. Again, you know what's going to happen. Ministries shoot up from 12 to 20. By 1975, he's got over 300,000 civil servants. He's ex he continues to extend the reach of the state into the rural areas, just as his father had pioneered. And he uses patronage. He sets up a foundation with his family name on it. He also, of course, owns vast tracts of land. And then he and his 60-odd family members have lots of different other assets. They take a slice of the oil rents, just as the Saudi royal family did. His assets were modestly estimated at something like $3 billion, quite a lot for a family to have. He owns shares in over 200 companies. His own portfolio, his private portfolio, was estimated at $1 billion. He had a lot of money to throw around, and he used this, again, for political purposes. He decided in around about 1960 to continue this transformation of the society. He even gave it a name. He called it the White Revolution to distinguish it from red revolutions, from left-wing revolutions. So he set up a series of reforms, a series of changes, designed again to try to transform the society. He launched a land reform program. He launched literacy and health campaigns. He continued to promote industrialization, and urbanization also was fostered. Let's go through these briefly. What about land reform? <coughs> land reform has often been used throughout the world, not just as a means to <coughs> increase social equity, although it, can, it often typically does that. And it's used not only as a means to increase agricultural production, although it sometimes does that, but it is always and invariably used as a means to break the power of local power holders. It's a variant on tearing down castles. It's a way to take away the land of the local elite and this way foster state centralization, and this is exactly what he did. He just tried to destroy successfully the power of nobles. But landlords, who after all were friendly to Shah in many ways, many of them, they could keep their, their holdings if they modernized, quote unquote, their farms, which meant basically if you put tractors on them. So they did, many of them. The main beneficiary, most detailed analyses show, were relatively well-off, better-off uh, local peasants. These had to join state-run cooperatives, and because of this conjuncture of slots of state people not getting any land and the breakup of all some traditional rights that people further down the social hierarchy had gotten, plus the mechanization, plus the lure of the cities due to the oil boom, all of this accelerates rural to urban migration. And this is something we want to watch very closely because it will be one of the phenomenon underpinning the Islamic Revolution in 1979 is a massive outflow of folks from the countryside into the cities as we'll see. Here's a picture of the Shah distributing land titles to a local farmer. And this was so his land reform program. Then he launched literacy and health campaigns. He sent a literacy corps out into the villages. The literacy rate rose considerably to 42%. So he's promoting literacy. There's an explosion in school enrollments because, remember, we were also getting this population explosion in Iran, as happened all over the global south after World War II. 
he tries to set up health programs, and you get this phenomenon, as we have already looked at in detail, of rapid population growth then leading with a lag to a youth bulge, which is coming online right around the late 1970s. On the eve of the revolution, half the population of Iran was less than 16 years old. This was a very young country at the time of the revolution, and enrollment in higher education triples. Rapid expansion of education, population goes way up. All of these kinds of social changes, remember, everywhere in the world have been socially destabilizing. Only rarely, however, do they produce revolutions, but well, Iran will be one of the cases when they do. The Shah is also promoting industrialization. He sets up five-year plans. Sure, he's a capitalist. Sure, he's opposed capitalist. Sure, he's opposed to Marxists, but he also has five-year plans, just like the Soviet Union, driven by oil rents. All kinds of infrastructure. He invests in all kinds of projects to build infrastructure. He does the usual import substituting industrialization pro uh, process. All kinds of factory production is increased. And there is a policy bias and a Dutch disease phenomenon. All these oil rents coming in, all this spending, there are lots of ways in which this dampens farmers' incentives. And this will do two things. It will increase rural to urban migration, and it will create upward pressure on food prices. And all of these things, we'll see this kind of boom, oil boom, and then when there's a kind of recession, this will be ideal socioeconomic conditions for social unrest. One of his projects was nuclear power. And this is an ad, guess who's building nuclear power, nuclear energy, today's answer from the time. And he's talking about how nuclear power was a good thing. So nuclear power, allegedly for peaceful purposes, was okay in Iran, way back with Americans, way back when the Shah of Iran was on the throne. Americans don't know about this, but all Iranians do. And so we thought this was all right. What happened with urbanization? Very rapid growth of the cities, from 6 to 16 million. By 1976, nearly half of the population is now living in cities. Tehran explodes from a city of 1.5 million to over five, to about 5.5 million in a single generation. Very rapid growth. And there is a large increase in the urban underclass living in shanty towns. And these people will be among the shock troops of the Islamic Revolution. Abrahamian has this little diagram that shows a kind of guess about the class structure in Iran. Tiny number of people, maybe a tenth of a percent at the upper class at the very top. Middle classes, modern salary types, 10%, and then the traditional, the bazaar folks, and then other folks of various kinds in urban and rural areas. So how do we get from the white revolution to the Islamist revolution? <coughs> Notice, this is a good example of what Karl Marx meant when he talked about contradictions in development. Development unfolds, and as it unfolds, it may strengthen the very forces that oppose the people in power. And here's one way that it did this. The urban workers and intelligentsia had long opposed the Shah, yet this urbanization, this development of industry, all these kinds of things, and education strengthened their hands. It undercut the notables. He deliberately destroyed those notables, although they had been one of the pillars of his father's regime. The gap between the rich and the poor is widening, and this in a society where the religion has a very strong component and a very strong stress on justice. It raised, but did not meet, the expectations of many people, and there is continued strength of the bazaar merchants who continue, despite all this so-called modernist production, they still control half of all handicraft production, which was huge in terms of, for example, Iranian carpets, which were exported all over the world, and other things, and two-thirds to three-quarters of internal trade. So they remained very powerful. 
We'll come back to that as we move into just talking about the nature of the Iranian Revolution. And first, we have to talk about ide ideologies of opposition. So again, this is the way to think about history. Look at these developments as they unfold. Look at the way the great transformation in both its socioeconomic and its state-centric dimensions <coughs> works all with regard to foreign powers entering, meddling, doing various things, and then also pay attention to ideological transformations. This man, a man named Ali Shariati, is very important in terms of the ideology. He was educated in France in the early 1960s when the large majority of Parisian intellectuals were Marxists or leftists of one sort or another. He blended the thought of Franz Fanon, whom some of you may have read in other classes, uh, who was from Martinique, who wrote a series of books, including The Wretched of the Earth, books about colonialism, and the horrors of colonialism, and he blended these ideas, were very current in the French-speaking Marxist world, with the ideas of Shiism. And he came up with this idea that true Shiism was a revolt against oppression is a classic kind of Islamist construction. Notice, this isn't a traditionalist idea. This is a way in which people are using their own inherited traditions and thought in from the modern world and trying to make sense out of it on their own, trying to come up with some notion of their own, just as you do, just as we all do, trying to make sense out of the world. So this idea of true Shiism was a revolt against oppression. He coined this idea that I mentioned before in the lecture on Islamism of the Mustazafin, that is, the deprived rather than the proletariat being the, the, the deprived, the people who were weak, the people who were downtrodden, those were the folks. His ideas had a strong appeal to educated youth in Iran. And remember, the number of these people is rising rapidly. But of course, Shariati, who died before the revolution actually started, was not by any means the most important ideologist, who, of course, was this man, the Ayatollah Khomeini. His father died when he was an infant. His mother died when he was 15. He was a specialist in a branch of theology that was called Kirfan, or Islamic mysticism, which had just barely become sort of marginally tolerated in most of the clerical institutes and universities uh, over the last couple of hundred years, but was still viewed as being kind of something that kind of people on the edge, kind of fringe individuals do. So he was had a certain marginality and also a strongly messianic quality to his thinking right from the beginning. His inspirations included the Muslim Brotherhood, the first big Islamist, modern Islamist organization founded in Egypt, and notice Musa Sadr, the man who was sort of the founder of the Shia revival in Lebanon. He was exiled in 1963. Uh, he was kicked out by the Shah. Uh, he was protesting against the land reform. Islam, uh, Islam is very clear about private property. He didn't like that. He was protesting of a bunch of other things that we'll talk about. His opposition to the Shah included in various reactionary pieces, like he, he was against Baha'is, a religion, uh, being get, getting a vote or women getting a vote. He was also against the autocracy of the Shah, its relations with Israel and the United States, and the kind of cultural politics that became known by a Farsi phrase translated as West toxification, this notion of their culture being eroded by foreign influences. His social base was in the bazaar, in the, in the traditional merchant class, and the urban underclass, especially recent migrants. It is always important to remember that one of the ways that Islamists succeed is by taking over the mantle of nationalism. And this is very much what Khomeini did. The United States got the Shah to pass a law in 1964 which exempted U.S. military 
and diplomatic, they gave us the diplomatic immunity in Iran. And this, by the way, is a large number of people. We had over 50,000 uh, U.S. people working there uh, who lived in isolated communities that didn't interact much with Iran in places like Isfahan, where they had major uh, industrial sites for helicopter construction and so on. And look what he says. They reduced the Iranian people to a level lower than an American dog. Oh, and by the way, in Islam, dogs are considered unclean. I mean, it's not like... This is a stronger insult than you would get uh, in, uh, in, if, if this were an American writing. Someone runs over an American's dog, he gets prosecuted. But even if the Shah runs over a dog, he wouldn't be prosecuted. If an American cook runs over the Shah, no one will have the right to interfere with him. So right from the beginning, there is this strong nationalistic quality to <laughs> He developed a theory, which is a, a new theory in Shiism, which is this notion of the regency of the jurist, which is what this phrase, Viliyati Fakir, is best translated out as, regent in the sense that the ultimate rule is by God, by the Mahdi, who will come down someday. So until that happens, somebody has to serve as the regent, just as if a king in, in Europe were under age, there would be a regent who would rule in his place, in his stead, on his behalf. That's the idea. And the jurist is a specific reference to Islamic law, uh, and that's what this was. Again, an innovation. She is... She, many Shi'is Ayatollahs did not and do not agree with this particular theory. This wasn't one of his innovations. He also argued that monarchy was fundamentally un-Islamic, and he wanted to get rid of it. This, of course, made him immediately an enemy of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, which is, after all, a monarchy, as well as the king of Jordan uh, and the, uh, the, the rulers along the Arab literal of the Persian Gulf. He attacked the Shah for his autocracy, for his economic and social ills. He viewed westernized Islamists, including the followers of Ali Shariati, with considerable suspicion. Like all revolutions, as we'll see, the Iranian revolution is characterized by all kinds of tendencies, tendencies and fissures, and different factions will not agree with other factions, and in revolutions, what will happen is that some faction will take over, and when that faction takes over, they will kill people in the other factions. This is the way revolutions typically work. He was staunchly anti-communist and anti-socialist, and he was deeply intolerant of anybody who disagreed with him. So this is the kind of ideology. He's exiled, kicked out of the country, and he winds up in Najaf, in Iraq, where he stays, and finally, under pressure, particular, uh, Saddam finally kicks him out, gets rid of him, and he goes to Paris, which he did this on the eve of, uh, sort of, in the 1970s. This was one of Saddam's worst mistakes. He has so many that it's hard to choose. But this would be one of them, because, of course, in Najaf, there he was kind of under wraps, under the control of Ba'athist security forces. He goes to Paris. He goes to a country with liberalized, with Western laws with freedom of speech. So he can make speeches, put them on cassettes, and, his, and then his followers can take those cassettes back into Iran. They circulate throughout the country, and this uh, then will matter, because the Shah, as is typical in revolutions, the Shah will make a series of fatal political mistakes. And what will happen is a process where we've sort of seen the kind of all the tinder being piled up here. We see these social transformations. We know how stressful they are. But as I say, that's true of every country in the world. And only in rare cases do you then get a revolution. So what specifically happened in Iran that produced this event that is, in many ways, the most fundamental event in the last generation in, in the region? Well, the Shah tried to centralize his power even further. Until 1975, he had parliament. There was a parliament. There were two parties. They were joked in Farsi. They called them the Yes Party and the Yes Sir Party. Two party. I mean, they were, they, you might think about that. <coughs> Local application. He announced that Iran would now become a one-party state called the Resurgence Party under his leadership, of course. He used this and state institutions, and then his mistake is he takes on both the clergy and the bazaar. This made a certain amount of sense, if you think about it, from the logic 
of constantly trying to centralize power. You're always looking for other sources of power, and you want to get rid of them. So his father had taken on the tribes, and he managed to smash those. And then he himself had taken on the local notables and undermined them. So now he turns to this other group, the traditional merchants, the bazaar, and the clergy, and goes after them. So there was a certain logic to this. But as we'll see, it turned out they were much stronger than he realized, and the whole thing will come crashing down around him. He attacks the clergy. First, there is an assault on seminaries. This had happened in 1963 uh, on, uh, as he was trying to arrest Khomeini, but also again in 1975. Allegedly, to build a green belt around the northeastern city of Mashhad, he tore down a whole series of seminaries. He replaced the Islamic calendar with an imperial calendar, 2,500 years of kingship, celebrating sort of, you know, the ancient Persian past, the pre-Islamic past. It's one I'm the inheritor of Cyrus the Great and other folks like that. And he threw a gigantic party in south uh, Western Iran, the ruins in Persepolis, which is the site of one of the pre-Islamic uh, Iranian capitals. And he threw this huge party, and he set up a religious core trying to bring the clergy, which, remember, unlike in Sunni countries, had retained its own independence from the state, not only independence in terms of decision-making, but also independence economically, and he tries to bring them under his own control. And here we have the Persepolis celebration of 1971, where clueless Westerners joined the Shah to party down. We have the Prince of Monaco, we have Prince Philip, I'm not sure who this particular individual is, maybe it's Prince Harry, and there's Spyro T. Agnew, uh, whom one the comedian Dick Gregory said he wasn't sure that he could chew, that he could walk and chew gum at the same time. But anyway, uh, these are the people that he invited and this, he imported 25,000 bottles of wine, set up three huge air-conditioned tents with 59 smaller tents. The total costs are conservatively estimated to have been some $200 million. And remember that for all this and all this kind of drinking alcohol, which is forbidden under Islamic law, doing all this, where there are very large numbers of people who just moved from rural areas with their very conservative social ethos into big cities where they're disorganized and they're poor and they're kind of bewildered. This really does not look like such a great thing to do. But of course, we all joined in the party because, well, we're clues. <laughs> then the Shah attacked the bazaar. He takes on them. He, they had a system of guilds, a system of internal training for uh, apprenticeships, essentially. He dissolved them. He had these urban renewal projects. And then he imposed price controls. What was happening here was just simple Dutch disease. He was spending vast amounts of oil rents. Production in the country couldn't keep up with this spending. Prices were rising. He was running the printing presses. And then he wanted to blame someone else for the inflation. And then he said, well, the way I'll stop this is have price controls. Mitch saying he floods the market with imported goods as a way to try to hold down prices, but that, of course, undermines the, those people, the, the local producers, who are often the bazaaris and the merchants. So he's doing a whole series of things that undercut both their material interests and are an affront to their basic worldview and their basic ideology. He then sets up an anti profiteering campaign where he basically blames the bazaaris for his own macroeconomic mismanagement. And last but not least, we have to look at the voice of Lord Acton. Lord Acton famously said that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. In the face of the Shah, I would only paraphrase this to say power deludes, absolute power deludes absolutely. The Shah thought he enjoyed overwhelming support. This on the eve of history's largest urban revolution. That's what he thought. He said this in 1976. I'm accompanied by a force that others can't see, my mythical force. I get messages, religious messages. Again, people start talking like this. There's the exit. Run, do not walk to the nearest exit. Always leaves the trouble. But for all his wealth, 
for all his centralization. He has the biggest army in Western Asia, the fifth largest army in the world. He has all these oil rents, and Machiavelli is still right. It is, for, it is not fortresses, but the wills of people, he said men in those days, that keep princes in power. And what happens in Iran is a classic case of the disintegration of legitimacy and of the mobilization of popular force. And so it begins. And it begins with a series and a cycle of protests. First, as usual in these, dra in, in these dramas, stupidity always plays a role. The role of, of stupidity in human affairs can be compared to the role of continental drift in geology. It's massive, it's powerful, it never goes away, and when it moves, it's devastating. The Shah published a personal attack on the Imam Khomeini, who was regarded as what's called an object of emulation. The way Shi'i Islam works is that every person who was a believer had to pick a particular ayatollah as being the person that they followed, and sort of that's the guy whom you try to copy. Millions of Iranians thought of the Ayatollah Khomeini, although he was in exile, as such a man. And so now the Shah has him attacked personally. Of course, seminary students in the city of Qom, which has a very large number of seminaries, began to protest. The Shah reacts as he usually does. He sends in the troops, and they shoot, and they kill some students. This then begins something that is uniquely Shi, which is a mourning cycle. 40 days, and you have this idea of you have, you wait 40 days, because that has to do with the myth of the saint, and then you have a big procession. And so you shoot these folks. 40 days later, everybody turns out in the street, and then what happens? It begins to turn not just to be a religious mourning ceremony, not just a funeral procession, but also a political demonstration. People start saying, who killed these guys? We're, we're grieving for their death. Who's responsible? Well, the Shah. So it's used for demonstrations, and you get this, then a cycle. Then those people will be fired upon, and they will be killed. This will outrage further people. And so you get an escalating cycle of larger and larger and larger protests that ultimately would engulf the Shah and his regime altogether. Black Friday, as it's called, is September 8th, when then there was a demonstration in Dallas Square in downtown Tehran. The Shah declared martial law, sent out the troops. They fired indiscriminately, killing many people. This ended the possibility of compromise. It ceased to be demands around specific policies, but instead began a demand down with the Shah, Mar Bar Shah, death to the Shah, overthrow the regime in its entirety became the slogan. There was a general strike called, and the oil workers participated, depriving the Shah of some revenues. You get two million people demonstrating in Tehran, where the city itself holds about five and a half million at the end of the holy month of Muhammad. Here's a picture of them demonstrating. The Shah built this monument as a for Cyrus the Great, as far as the eye could see in his next photo, millions of people demonstrating against the Shah, calling for the abolition of his rule. So this leads to his demise. Critically, again, conjuncture always matters. Always. And there's one personal detail that probably was also critical. The Shah was sick. He was suffering from cancer, although most people didn't know this. He had no confidence in his young son's ability. So here was his choice. He could try to face down these demonstrators with sheer repression. He could kill hundreds of thousands of people. This was something that his father probably would have done. He realized that to do this, he would have to stay around for a long time, and he was dying. And he thought, what am I going to hand off to my son? This guy's a kid. He can't really deal with this. This is a revolutionary situation. The army began to crack. The army, people in the army who were largely, again, conscripts, peasant boys, boys from the slums. They're shooting at people just like them. And they begin to be influenced by the ideology of the revolutionaries. And they start deserting. They stop shooting. The bureaucrats joined the revolution. 
his money and patronage proved to be useless because, in effect, he had alienated everybody in Iran. He had alienated the mullahs and the clergy. He had alienated the poor. He had alienated the urban, sophisticated middle class. He had alienated everybody except the security services. And these, in the face of huge demonstrations, begin to disintegrate. He winds up having no support at all. He flees the country February 11, 1979, and he died a few uh, a year later of cancer in Cairo. So we now get his regime is gone. What next? Two regimes, two conceptions of political legitimacy. Flags can tell you a lot. We've looked at the one on the left, which was the flag of the Pahlavi dynasty. The flag on the right is the flag of the Islamic Republic of Iran which has in stylized script Allah or God right in the middle and then along the border in, in very stylized Kufic script Allahu Akbar, God is most great, which is how the call to prayer in Islam begins. So this was an Islamic conception of legitimacy. The perspective of these Islamist revolutionaries is shown in one of their posters, which shows Khomeini driving the Shah down into hell clutching the coattails of Uncle Sam, who wears a Union Jack, a British waistcoat, and has on a hat with the Israeli flag. So that's what happens uh, there. Here's some scenes from the, this revolution. This revolution is one of the most fascinating, <laughs> sociologically speaking, events in modern history. What's so fascinating about it is, once again, history is always filled with, with contradictions and surprises. From a social point of view, from an economic and sociological point of view, the revolution in Iran is almost a is exactly the kind of revolution that Karl Marx thought would happen in Europe. That is, you get people moving to cities, you get more and more people working in factories, and then at some point these people rise up in the cities and riot and take over. He just thought that that, and that is what happened in Iran. But the, the twist is, rather than this being led by Marxists, by people with one, that particular ideology, these were led by messianic Islamic revolutionaries. There's kind of an ironic twist uh, on that. <coughs> Here's show the demonstrations where it begins in Pum. Like I say, these demonstrations were enormous. Huge numbers of people participating, running from gunfire in the streets. Tehran University, essentially everyone turning out to demonstrate. People burning pictures of the Shah. People fleeing into the university because the university had traditionally been viewed as a kind of sanctuary, as were mosques. This was, to put it mildly, not always respected. Uh, what folks were fleeing in there, fleeing from the soldiers. And the revolutionaries were not nonviolent. They were fighting back. They burst into armories. They got guns. They got weapons. There was lots of shooting back and forth. There it was a, quite a chaotic situation. Here are people, some students running away from troops who were shooting at them. And so you get people demonstrating, including these women here, holding on to M16s on the back of a pickup truck. Uh, there was wide uh, participation by women in this revolution. Here are some soldiers coming over to the side of the revolutionaries, people tearing down a statue of the Shah, people celebrating on military vehicles. And of course, in revolutions, what always happens is that those members of the old regime who stick around get killed. Uh, officers in Sabah and the high-ranking officers of the army were shot as soon as the revolutionaries could get their hands on them. Khomeini then flies in from Paris, February 1st, 1979. He lands in Tehran. He is greeted by people chanting in his favor. And now, as is typical in revolutions, once the old regime collapses, now you get the struggle for power among the revolutionaries. How did this play out? In this period from 79 to 82, there will be a struggle for power. Indeed, it will continue. It still is going on in some ways, but it begins. One way is to personalize it. That's too simple. But Khomeini against a man named Matthew Bazargan, who were friends in many ways, 
Khazar Khan was a very pious man, but he wanted a secular constitution. He did not like this idea of the, the, of the regency of the jurist, Viliyaki Kapi, who was against that. He was the head of the provisional government. This often happens in revolutions. You get a provisional government because the people are still trying to figure out what kind of government we're going to have. So there's a provisional government. And just as Lenin did with the provisional government of Alexander Kerensky, uh, Lenin set up his own sort of shadow state of Soviets. Khomeini did something very similar. He set up a dual state of committees, a kind of shadow clerical government of Islamists and re revolutionaries around him. And there was a kind of a compromise, a compromise between theocracy and democracy, clerical authority and popular sovereignty, which to this day is a fundamental contradiction that is embedded in the Iranian constitution and the structure of, of rule. One of the top ayatollahs also opposed Khomeini's ideas. Who was this guy, Bazargan? Well, Ed, he was educated as an engineer in France, very pious man. He had been the head of the, of the National Oil Company under Mossadegh. The Shah, of course, locked him up after the coup. He was the first president of the Islamic Republic. He opposed direct rule by the clerics. He opposed the continuation of the Iran-Iraq War in 1982, after the Iranians had driven the Iraqis out of Iran. He died in 1995. He was sidelined, removed from power, and died in 1995. In other words, this guy, the Ayatollah who opposed Khomeini, he was the most senior Ayatollah in the country, more senior than Khomeini, who, remember, was a somewhat marginal figure. Even among Ayatollahs, because of his sort of peculiar leanings, he was kind of an outlier in some ways. And this guy was anything but an outlier. He was the clerical establishment. He was a vehement critic of this idea of the, the regency of the jurist. He was implicated, we're not really sure whether this is true or not, it was just an excuse in 1982, he was in prison, he was probably tortured, and he died under house arrest in 1986. So he will disappear. Abrahamian has a very useful diagram here of the government of, of the constitution of Iran. The important thing to see here is the way this works. What you get is, here's the electorate, and yes, they elect the president, and yes, they elect the legislature, and so legislature, executive, judicial, all of this looks pretty familiar to us. It's this stuff that's different. Here's the supreme leader. Yeah. Now, the assembly of experts, this, this diagram could look like, well, they elect him, so he's ultimately elected. But that's not really true. These experts were set up in, to begin with, and then they have input. But notice what this guy can do. He sets up a guardian council which works with the legislature and also runs the Expediency Council. What's the Expediency Council? The Expediency Council are the people who make decisions. Note this for later. Notice, where is the president in all this? Where is the president? Over here. This is not like the American constitutional system. The president of Iran is not in charge of the, of the basic forces of the state for security purposes, the person who's in charge of the government of Iran is the supreme leader, which today is a man named Ali Khamenei, that we'll talk about in a minute. So, struggle for power, violent, brutal, and as usual, all politics is local. What was the seizure of the American hostages all about? From an Iranian perspective, it's very simple. It was a move by Khomeini's followers to consolidate their power, and it worked. How did it happen? Well, you have this situation of Bazargan and this other Ayatollah trying to get rid of this assembly of experts and the concept of a supreme leader. President Carter admitted the Shah for cancer treatment in October of 1979, and so Khomeini's followers came into the American embassy, overwhelmed the Marine Guards, and took over, took the diplomats hostage in November of 1979. And they held them hostage for over a year. To put it mildly, this inflamed American opinion rather considerably, and Bazargan resigned. What were the consequences of this hostage crisis? It consolidated Khomeini's power. To this day, it has embittered U.S. and Iranian relations. It undermined dramatically 
Jimmy Carter and strengthen Ronald Reagan with all kinds of other consequences in terms of what happened to the economy, what happened to energy policy, all kinds of things. Everything is connected to everything else, remember. It may be that it emboldened Saddam to invade Iran, because after all, boy, the Americans really don't like these people, and so for maybe they'll help me out if I get into trouble, which as we saw in some ways we actually did. And finally, the hostages were released. When were they were released? The day that Ronald Reagan was in Iran. It had worked. It served their purposes, which was to consolidate their power. They didn't want to fight the United States. They were already fighting the Iraqis. And so they used it long enough to do this. And there are all these images of students burning American flags and the hostages being carried around blindfolded. All of this enraged Americans. And then, as we know, actually right away at that time, the Iran-Iraq war starts because Saddam attacks. This further consolidated the revolutionary state. Typically, when you attack a revolutionary regime, that's what happens. That's what happened when the aristocrats in Germany, exiles from France and, and England, attacked the, revolution, the revolutionary regime of France. It consolidated the revolution. It's what happened when the Allies attacked the Bolsheviks in Russia. It helped consolidate uh, the, the revolution. It happened again in the Chinese Revolution, and it happened again here. This war, the state makes war, and war makes the state. Over and over again in history, you can see this. It led to a huge expansion of the military, the creation of the Republican Guards, expanded the state reach in all kinds of ways, and critically also created an entire generation of Iranians who survived the slaughter of the trenches and the gas warfare, who have great loyalty to the ideals of the Islamic Republic, because they suffered and sacrificed so much. It's a typical, very understandable human reaction. That generation is now the generation that is basically running Iran. If you think about it, this war was 30 years ago. Those guys were in their 20s and teens. Those folks are now in their 40s and 50s. That is typically the generation that runs nation states. And that's what's going on right now in, in Iran. Here are the trenches. What a mess. World War One in Tehran, they have a place called the Behesh Zahra, a, a, a martyr's it's a cemetery. They have a fountain where they use food coloring to have blood gushing from the fountain. This is a culture. This is a cultural sort of idea, a meme of sacrifice, of blood sacrifice for the defense of ultimate ideals sanctioned by the deity. This is a very strong idea. We might think about is it a good idea to get into a big fight with folks who think like this when they number 70 million? Maybe not. The war ended, the Iran-Iraq war, one of the things that caused it to end was the fate of an Iranian flight. There was a civilian jet going from Bandar Abbas in Iran to Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. A U.S. Navy ship that was in, we had a number of ships in the Gulf protecting tanking routes and so on, and taking hot shots, we wiped out the Iranian uh, Navy very quickly at one point uh, when they, they sent, sent some speedboats around. But the commander, widely regarded as something of a cowboy, and perhaps I should say a sea boy, uh, thought it was a military plane. He shot it down and served as an air missile. It killed everybody on board. We finally, this went to the International Court of Justice in The Hague, there were various negotiations, we finally paid compensation, but we'll note, we never admitted responsibility, it's hard to see how we didn't have responsibility, I mean, we did it, we shut it down, or apologized to the Iranian government. One possible consequence of this was Khomeini became convinced, okay, the Americans, we can't fight the Americans, we can fight Saddam, we can't fight the Americans, I will, as he said, drink the poison chalice and cease trying to overthrow Saddam Hussein. He did not live to see the British move of the United States doing that work for him and overthrowing Saddam. So there it is. That's the root of the shape of the flight. That's where it was shot down. That's what those airliners look like. And that's what uh, the, the, that's a picture of the sense. So consolidation. Consolidation of regime uses carrots and sticks. How did this regime consolidate itself? Well, it's a war economy, so everything is going to be rationed. 
This allows the state great control over everybody because you set up ration cards, you set up distribution systems, and everybody's interacting with government bureaucrats. <coughs> they took over something like 2,000 factories. And then they set up a very important institution in terms of understanding the Islamic Republic of Iran, a thing called the Bunyad, which means foundations. These foundations are controlled by clergymen, mullahs, who are highly political. They answer only to the supreme leader, and they control billions of dollars of assets. They are gigantic holding companies. <coughs> so again, these are diversified organizations, business organizations with all kinds of different ways. And we are talking about culture, people who have been traders for millennia, very, very sophisticated mercantile culture. Again, we might think that uh, sanctions now work so well with people like this who are very organized and very good at this. So anyway, this consolidates the regime's power. In the book I wrote with John Waterbury, you can read a little more about one of the ironies of this, is that here's this regime where the I remember that Khomeini was protesting against nationalizations and protesting against land reform on the grounds of Islamic defense of private property, and yet this very Islamic regime turns out to create not exactly state-owned property, probably the way they finesse it uh, ideologically, but again, essentially a kind of mechanism of state-controlled, highly non-competitive uh, economic production. Then there's the stick. Revolutions always use a lot of sticks in consolidating their power. Some 500 opponents of the regime were executed in that period, but it gets worse because there was an organization called the People's Mujahideen. They were sort of, they called themselves Marxist Islamists, a kind of blend. They supported uh, the man who succeeded Bazar Ghan, a man named uh, Bani, uh, Bani Sadr, as president. He, they tried to overthrow the government. There were assassinations. And this man, whose name was Sadr Khalkali, often called the Hanging Judge, basically set up assembly line executions of anybody suspected of opposition, and they were shot in large numbers. Torture was rampant. And people who had supported the revolution, all of these people, and again, this is typical. It happened in the French Revolution. It happened in the Russian Revolution. It happened in the Chinese Revolution. Re revolutions have a way of devouring their own children. As the Polish dissident Adam Michnik put it, those who start by storming Bastilles end up building their own. I regret to say that Adam Michnik sort of forgot about this and he supported the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, but oh well, everybody, I suppose, made some bad mistakes. So you get an uneasy alliance, and to this day there has been this kind of alliance. Two very different sets of socioeconomic interests lie at the base of this regime. Populist lower and lower middle classes on the one hand, with prosperous mullahs and bazaaris on the other. And maintaining this, this is going to shift, this has shifted back and forth. One group gets more powerful, the other group goes down, and it goes back and forth, and with complex ideological maneuvering, this is the social coalition that undergirds the Islamic Republic. There are rich groups, and then there are disadvantaged groups. And they, in turn, give rise to all kinds of different political tendencies. It's again, from Abrahamian's book, showing some different factions. You know, different kinds of factions here. Up here are the reformers in the Islamic left. And who are these? Well, intellectuals and folks like that. There's a pragmatic right, a kind of, you know, conservative economically, pretty pragmatic kinds of guys, government bureaucrats. Both of these groups have been essentially sidelined as of now. We'll talk about how that happened. And today, this group, again, the Bazaris and the security apparatus, are firmly in control of the regime, although how firmly is very much in doubt. So, the war ends. There is always something in a revolution, this goes back to the French Revolution, the idea of thermidor, that is, a reaction. There is a kind of conservatizing reaction that comes after the revolution has consolidated itself. There are two power brokers, the supreme leader, who is Ali Khamenei, and this guy, Ali Rastanjani, 
He takes over, he becomes president, basically for nearly a decade in the 1990s. What's his program about? Well, he's rich. His friends are rich. He wants to liberalize the economy. This is the 1990s, the era of neoliberalism. He wants to participate in some of this. He, as we saw, also oversaw this huge change in demography uh, that we talked about before. He cut the military budget, and he faced a lot of serious challenges. Low oil prices in the 1990s, rising unemployment and inflation. There's some recovery of oil production, but it's slow, it's difficult. Oil revenues stay low for two reasons. <coughs> One of them is shown here because of the nature of production. It has been difficult for Iranians to get sufficient investment from oil companies. The United States has long had sanctions on this, and we do everything we can to prevent this. So we'll see that has been changing recently with the entrance of new actors uh, in, the, in the oil business, but this is part of it. But also, production has been difficult. And then second, of course, in the 1990s, oil prices were very low. And so, unsurprisingly, oil revenues stagnated. And you get the usual problems. You get unemployment being rather large. In the late 90s, I think I mentioned you in a previous lecture, once I was invited to talk to a little workshop put on by the American intelligence community, and we talked about it long, and there were several neoconservatives there, and they were very convinced that the government was about to fall, and what was their argument? Well, oil prices are low, the regime has less legitimacy than it once did, they don't have enough revenue, and people are unemployed, and so they'll overthrow the government. And I said, no, I don't agree with you. The reason I don't is that you're right about everything except the regime has enough money to support its core constituency, and as long as they have the monopoly on the instruments of violence, there is no reason to imagine to take this here. Turns out most of the intelligence analysts also agreed with me, but anyway, that's where really the case. This man gets elected. He's a liberal. He was a professor of Western thought at Tehran University. He was a librarian. He called for dialogue with civilizations. He was hugely <coughs> popular in Iran. He was a guy who wanted better relations with the West. He was an open-minded kind of influence. And this was a very fragile flowering, which, as we'll see, gets snuffed out. He won 80% of the population turned out to vote. 70% of them voted for him. It was huge. It was massively popular. His core support was women who are over half the population, modern middle class people, urban workers. He won local elections and parliamentary elections in a second term. He won time and again. But, and he pushed cultural liberalization. But remember, it's one thing to have elections, but it all depends on who controls the instruments of power, in particular. Who is it that controls the budget? And who is it that controls the monopoly on violence? And that wasn't him. He also sought improved relations with foreign powers, including the, you managed to get a resumption of diplomatic relations with, with the British. But there was inevitably a backlash. 25, there's this core out there. Well, maybe nobody knows, but 20 to 25 percent of the population, veterans, various populists, hardcore ideologues, they support the hardliners. And this Council of Guardians vetoed bill after bill after bill. They vetoed people who could run for office. They harassed intellectuals, journalists, activists. The Revolutionary Guards went into Tehran University, beating up students, throwing them out of windows, things like this. And then, very unhelpfully, George Bush gives his axis of evil speech, making opposition to conservatives in Iran seem like tre treason. This is a very important to remember. Think about Iranian history. Think about the role of foreigners, particularly Russians, and then especially British, and most recently Americans, and how we look in the eyes of Iranians. If you are a beleaguered, nationalist, belligerent regime, what do you want? What's good for you? To have tensions with the Americans. Because then, anybody who favors liberalization of relations with the United States, you can say, well, these guys are traitors. 
because the Americans obviously want to attack us. They obviously want to bomb us. They obviously want to do all kinds of things to us. Look at what they did in the past. Look at Operation Ajax. Look at the British before that. These are just the same. So don't listen to them. Listen to us instead. And this is the kind of problem. As it was said, real men want to go to Tehran. That was the slogan. Everyone wants to go to Baghdad. Real men want to go to Tehran. And so the conservatives win in the election of 2005. The liberal middle class stayed home. They were gross and disillusioned because Hatami, although popular, couldn't do anything. The conservative base was mobilized. They ran war veterans and hyped patriotism and resistance to the Americans. You see this in the, uh, in the American right. Same thing. Exactly the same thing. They voted for a populist over Rastanjani, who was viewed as a fat cat. And populism was contained. I sent you an article by Abrahamian uh, about talking about the role of populism in maintaining. It's worth looking at. And we'll start with that next time when you'll also get back your papers. Have a nice day. پیر گشت و تغییر درون این